Hello, I'm glad to see so many people came out. Uh, I recognize uh, several faces and several people that I've worked with in the past who uh, have an interest in uh, Joseph Bailey uh, Homestead at uh, Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore. Uh, we have some primary guests here who've worked there for many, many years and given uh, a considerable amount of their time and lives toward the Bailey Homestead. Uh, at this time, the Bailey Homestead is not being as active as it needs to be as far as education for um, the surrounding communities, and a lot of people are losing interest in it because uh, the park really needs more funds uh, to try to run this facility. And I think the people in the state of Indiana need to realize the historical background of it. And this is generally what we find when we go to any type of history. The first thing they say, well, there was just never any information. We just don't have it. Nothing was ever written. Well, I brought a couple of just small books. I didn't want to overwhelm anybody by the fact that there is some uh, fantastic uh, information historical based. Uh, in which we can prove what we need to to show this to be a historical uh, facility. They call it the Joe Bailey uh, Homestead. His actual name was Henri Boutin Joseph de Maison. So he had quite a moniker. He was uh, born in uh, Varennes, Canada, which would have been the province of Quebec at that time period. Uh, he had. Uh, uh, can we hold on a second? Can everybody turn off their cell phones, please? He had, uh... <laughs> can everybody turn off their cell phones, please? That's what you're hearing. That's what I did. Okay. That's what you're hearing. Thank you. I believe he was the eldest child in his family of uh, four children. Uh, it was a huge fur trading era at that time period. We have a book here, a simple little book called Canadian Passports. Uh, and it's dated from 1681 to 1752. It is fantastic in the fact that it tells the name of every person who came into the United States by way of Canada, who was involved in the fur trade and had to have a license to trade. I got this little book for 10 cents at a historical society. <laughs> and in the back, they have where you sign your name to take it out. There was not one signature. It had never been taken out, which was a real shame. It's an unbelievable historical record. It not only has their names, it tells where they were going, how many canoes were loaded, who was paying for it, uh, was it the government? And it also gave us an idea of how many licenses <coughs> were uh, taken out every year, which was approximately 25. Well, these licenses were quite important in uh, Canada due to the fact that it cost a thousand pounds, which is very expensive, but it cost a lot more than that. But they did, these licenses were actually given to widows and priests. So the woman who was a widow would take $500. That was her, not dollars, I mean pounds. She would take the 500 pounds, that would be her living expense. She was a widow, she had children to take care of. But if she was smart, she could also get a brand new roof, 10 years worth of uh, wood cut for her, uh, probably a couple gardens plowed and uh, totally seeded with potatoes and whatever type of other seed she needed, and maybe a couple fresh cows and maybe a couple of hogs, because the fur traders would bid and do anything to get this license from her because only 25 were given out. The other 500 pounds went back to the government. So it was very important. They kept unbelievable records. But it literally has thousands of names, and almost every one of these names can see, be seen right now in the United States as the names of our rivers, the names of our towns, uh, even our state capitals. Uh, but we don't know where that foundation comes from, and it comes right from that book right there. With Joseph Bailey, his father was a merchant, which was important at that time. The merchants were the ones who outfitted the canoes. They're the ones who hired these people to come down to the United States to do their trading. The only problem with Joseph Bailey was is that his father died when he was just a young man. So this automatically, according to Canadian hierarchy, put him out of everything. There, everyone was treated by certain standards. 
If your father was a voyager, you would be a voyager. If you were a fur trader, your children would be fur traders. If you were bourgeois, your sons would be bourgeois, which is a higher class. You would wear nicer clothes and a top hat. And you wouldn't be doing the rowing, but you'd be doing the hiring of all the men. If you were an owner, you didn't do anything. <laughs> you didn't even get out of the canoe. You were picked up and carried to the shore, just as the trade goods were. If you were the government, they got whatever they wanted and hired whoever they wanted for whatever price they wanted. The biggest thing was <coughs> Joseph Bailey's father came from Varennes, but he traded in Montreal, so he was considered one of the Montreal traders. And that's where almost all of the goods came from, was from Montreal. And this is where all of the fur trading companies began and the ones who owned those companies. Um, very few are by name, only the biggest ones. They were all called the Montreal traders or Montreal merchants. But when they came into the United States, it was a whole different thing. Joseph Bailey, since his father died, did not have enough money to back him up because his mother was a widow. He had other sisters and brothers to contend with, but his father gave him something very special before he passed away. And this was all due to his uncle. His <laughs> uncle was an archbishop. And in him being an archbishop, he was able to give him an education. And that was the most important thing in that time period was an education. But his uncle also got an enormous amount of trouble due to the fact that uh, he had this really ludicrous idea and thought that every child should receive a free education. For that, <laughs> he almost was kicked out of the priesthood, had to go actually before <laughs> his peers and prostrate himself and ask for forgiveness. And then he was put into uh, not too good of a job after that. Kind of uh, brushed away into Nova Scotia for a, quote, a while just to keep him quiet. Uh, that was a horrible idea, free education. We still don't have that together, we'll work it out. <laughs> but with that education, he was able to come to the United States and work for other people and earn enough money to do what he wanted to do without the hierarchy in Canada. He did not have to stay with that. When he came to the United States, he found out, well, one wonderful thing was, it didn't cost you a thousand pounds for a trade license, it was only ten dollars. And you could go almost any place and get that trader's license, whether it was Mackinac, whether it was Detroit, St. Joseph, uh, Lafayette, you could get it for ten dollars. So a lot more licenses were given out here and a lot more profit went into your pocket. And you didn't have to stick to one company for your trade goods, you could go, you could go to several to buy trade goods to bring into your business. With Joseph Bailey, the first place he went to and what was the closest place was of course Mackinac Island. Mackinac Island was the mecca of the entire United States at that time period for the Great Lakes. There was no no canoe that left Canada that did not come through Mackinac Island. And that's because we wanted our taxes. <clears throat> Every canoe load coming down from Canada, which would be a two month trip by river canoe before they would get to the Great Lakes, put their goods into the Great Lakes boats and then bring them down. From Mackinac down to St. Joseph, it was another month. So it was three months of traveling before they could even get the trade goods down here. But at Mackinac, everything had to be unloaded, every single item, and taxed by the United States government. But first it was taxed by the Brits. Now this is another problem that Joseph Bailey had. He was, of course, a Francais Canadian, but he was also British by politics because of the time period that he was born in. So we would automatically think, he spoke perfect English, right? It was the government was all British. No, he spoke a very broken English at best. He always used French, Canadian, and I'm not saying French, I'm saying French Canadian. This is because when the French came into Canada, they had to learn a whole new habitat. They learned animals, they learned trees, they learned people, all had different names, so what they had to do is take the languages of those people and integrate that into their language. 
So it became a whole new language, the French Canadian language, but Algonquin mixed in with it, which was Native American language. In other words, they wouldn't say, well, what kind of a fish is that? Well, they might be a shark, they wouldn't know. <laughs> they had to know the different names for the different type of fish and what they were eating or the different kinds of plants to make sure they weren't eating a poisonous plant or maybe that was a medicinal plant that they were using. So they had to learn these terms. So this is what he spoke, is a broken English and French Canadian and Algonquin. When he went to Mackinac, he did the best thing possible. He found Native American life. And that's what most voyagers, most fur traders, and most merchants did. They found Native American wives because those Native American wives were connected to a tribe and, oh, there's your customers. That's where you got your customers, from these Native American wives. They had lots of relatives and they would trade with them because, of course, he was going to give them special presents each time they came to his post or he went to visit them. Well, he wasn't trading when he went to visit them, of course. Uh, well, anyway, <laughs> he was taking and doing a good deal. He had five children from that first marriage. Of that uh, first marriage, there were four boys and one daughter. One of the sons, the third eldest son, became a straight representative for the state of Minnesota because he was educated as well. His education was not as fine as his father's. That's because he was educated <laughs> not by priests. He was educated in a normal school. And you can tell this from his handwriting. And you can see the difference between Alex's, uh, Alexis, I mean, uh, handwriting and Joseph Bailey's handwriting. Joseph Bailey's is much more formal, beautiful handwriting. All of us would wish we had. Uh, and we have some examples of some of the French writing. And this is what it could be like. This is the only representation that we know of of Joseph Bailey, this picture right here, which was found in a memory book of Rose, which was from the second family, a daughter from the second family. This is his actual baptismal record. It is the only one I've ever found that actually says, Henri Boutin, Honorable Gentleman Joseph Bailey de Mazin. It is calling him an Honorable Gentleman at birth. That's very unusual. So when he went to Mackinac Island, he was able to make a lot of connections. Um, for many years, people have thought that he worked for the American Fur Trading Company. He did not work for them. He did buy product from them, but he did not work for them. He did not work for the Northwest Company. He did not work for the Green Bay. He did not work for the Hudson Bay. So there were probably two dozen fur trading companies, the Southwest, the Northwest. He didn't work for any of these. He found it more lucrative to actually work for one person. So he actually worked as a bourgeois. The man who hired the canoes, who hired the voyageurs, <laughs> who did all of the books. And this is who he was doing the books for. His name was Dominique uh, Razulo. And he worked for him, with him for many years. He was actually, Dominique was actually a silversmith. Lived in Montreal, had a wife in Montreal and Native American children at Mackinac. He also had a Native American woman there as well. And that comes right back down to this area. Most people do not realize it, but they call the father of South Bend had two of the most beautiful daughters anybody could possibly imagine. They were debutantes. But they were very angry, the people of South Bend, at this man because he allowed his children to receive Indian lands. And they figured that was because, well, he's a fur trader, he's the father of South Bend. That's why they got, their father was Dominique. His Indian wife died. And I'm not gonna tell you who the father of South Bend is, but I'll make you look it up. I've got to do some research. But he adopted those two daughters. Him and his wife had never had children. He adopted those two daughters, and they were never considered Native American. But they were, and quite beautiful. And like you said, debutantes of that time period. They were the leaders of all the balls, dances. They were beautiful young ladies who could speak several languages. Going back to Joseph Bailey, he worked for this man. He, Dominic, spent most of his time in Montreal because he was the merchant. He was 
uh, getting into silver, which was a big deal at that time. He had several silver smiths working for him. He had several men working as far as uh, making clothing, making packs, uh, waterproofing uh, canvases. Uh, to waterproof a canvas, they would take um, cloth, stretch it onto a frame, then it was painted uh, with simply flour. But you know when you add flour to it, it makes a paste. Water and flour make a paste. But it's always lumpy. You can't get the lumps out. So they would paint it on one side, then they would take sandpaper or sandstone and sand this entire thing. This thing was as big as this wall that they were waterproofing. But this cloth needed to be made to be wrapped around their packs to make tents out of. So he had to run that and make sure that this was done. <laughs> then once they had uh, sanded it, they repainted it again, sanded it again, repainted it again. This waterproofed it. Because when it was stretched, we had all these little tiny pores. So that's what they were filling in with this paste. And then it would harden. Now, he would stay in Montreal. Let's say he would get all of the merchandise down. Uh, oh, at least two or three times a year, he would come down to Montreal, especially when the furs were going in and when the furs were going out. The canoes would be going out around May. He would come down and make sure that he wasn't being ripped off by the tax man when he was unloading these canoes. <coughs> and then they would come back with the furs again the next spring. So he always made sure he was there at that time period and always checked his goods to make sure they hadn't gotten wet, make sure somebody hadn't ripped them off. Uh, because a lot of times there was some fibbing going on. Oh, well, those were, pff, furs got all wet and we just had to chuck them out. No. Or the goods got wet and we had to, no. Sometimes they got hid behind things. But when you consider a lake canoe will hold 2,000 pounds of goods, that's a lot of goods to be handling. At best, these canoes could make 15, 20 miles a day. They stayed close to the shorelines. They were all made of the birch bark. But the biggest problem was they could not be landed. And this is a fallacy you see in most pictures. This is what's taught in our schools. You see these guys coming down the ooh, rocky rapids uh, through the water. Yeah, well, that would rip the whole bottom out after the first rock. You can see they're only this thick. Every night, the boys' ears would uh, spend the night not only hiding under them to keep the mosquitoes from carrying them out, but they would also be retiring them with pitch to keep the water out of them. They would constantly have to be repitched. But that canoe could last three to five years, just made out of that thin bark. What they would have to do, as soon as they got close to the shore, every man and jack was out with the goods on top of their shoulders, especially when they were in a lake canoe that would hold 2,000 pounds. That's a lot of goods. If you happen to be taking uh, an owner down to one of the forts, he was out too. He was up on your shoulders. If he had a couple of guests with him, they were up on your shoulders too. So every boys in that boat had to get out, grab the goods, run it in, then gently pick up their canoes and take them in. <laughs> and most people re don't, do not realize that fact. They think these things were made of steel or something, but they weren't. But they were quite durable in the Great Lakes. And probably the only mode of transportation at that time period that was infallible, <coughs> but so <laughs> light and uh, airy to take when you had to go uh, over a 10 mile portage, you wouldn't be wanting to be carrying anything too heavy. Uh, mostly uh, on a river canoe, uh, one man could carry. On a lake canoe, it would take two men to carry that canoe and all the trade goods would have to be carried around the portage. So that was the difference. Joseph Bailey stayed with his wife and stayed with Dominic for several years. Uh, his biggest problem came when uh, the War of 1812 came. Uh, this unsettled many things. Uh, like I said, the British were in control of the entire Great Lakes region, all the way down into Indiana here. Uh, all the way probably past Lafayette, just a little ways. What the, he had to do during the War of 1812 is decide what he wanted to do. Was he gonna be an American? Was he gonna be a Brit? He decided to be the French Britain. He was British and he fought and he was put in jail for it because he got caught uh, taking guns as well as many of the other uh, French British uh, that were in the Great Lakes at that time period. So 
after the War of 1812, of course, the Americans, us, we won. That's why we gave the pledge of the flag. We are the owners now of the entire Great Lakes on this side of the border. Joseph Bailey could not stay here. The United States government made a law and kicked every voyager out of the United States. Any of anybody of British uh, government, uh, they threw out. Unless they could get a tree, um, what do you call it, a citizenship. Joseph Bailey didn't get a citizenship because, like I said, he wasn't working to the Montreal traders. He wasn't working <coughs> to a big company. They could not obtain citizenship for him. So he moved his family to Drummond Island. Just before going to Drummond Island, it was that time period that he got rid of one family and developed a new relationship with another family. He took on a different woman of Native American heritage. Uh, her family was actually from down around uh, the Grand River area. And so he made all new customers. He left his family there. He sent his boys to uh, Canada, Montreal, to be educated. The youngest boy refused to go, actually jumped out of the canoe, uh, would not go, wished to stay with his mother, who was Native American and her tribe. The other three boys were sent to Montreal. I have letters from these boys as to what happened while they were there, and these letters are not very good. Uh, it puts a whole different picture on Joseph Bailey, and uh, I'm, I'm afraid of very deep-seated hatred for him, because they felt themselves to be completely and totally abandoned by their father, um, and essentially they were because of the War of 1812. He was not able to pay for their education. Uh, after a certain amount of time, he was not able to pay the people who were actually taking care of them, boarding them. So he, they ran up a huge bill. And then he had also depended on uh, one of his uh, cousins to help him. And he didn't help him as well. So it started a big riff in the family. Toussaint Pochier was his cousin and also the godfather of Alexis Bailey. Uh, ended up the boys being thrown out on the street. Alexis himself was considered a dandy. You can see he dresses a little bit better. <laughs> but that would be uh, the same way a bourgeois would dress, in the same fashion, with this type of a coat, uh, with a tie, and with a top hat, or a smaller kind of smooshed in top hat and would go out just a little ways. But it showed they were a higher class of people. He went to Mackinac Island and was there at the same time period as, as his father. Uh, he's listed in the 1810 uh, voting registers as well as uh, the census records there. And from that, he um, actually went to Minnesota, uh, married into a fur trading family, the Fairbanks. Uh, had quite a few children, uh, a few made it to uh, adulthood, uh, they died of different diseases, uh, cholera, uh, and different, even from measles, uh, whooping cough, different things. Uh, he later married another woman because his wife also passed away. So he ended up marrying another woman uh, that was in the fur trading, uh, connected with the fur trading air. Joseph Bailey left Mackinac Island and went to Drummond Island took his new wife. She had two daughters from a previous marriage. Uh, her husband was uh, Jacob uh, de la Vigne, uh, which means Jacob of the Vine, which simply means probably his father was uh, a vineyard keeper or made wine, one or the other. But he was also Native American as well. He was uh, part Ottawa as well as French Canadian. He uh, had two children by her two daughters. Joseph Bailey took care of those daughters and then had more children with this lady. It is said that he had five children with her. But at this time period, I can only prove four. So I cannot prove that there was actually a son. And, <laughs> oh, I knew I was going to get that mm, lip from you. <laughs> yes, Robert Bailey was what they called him. There is no historical evidence to the fact that this child existed. Uh, when we look at the school records, uh, he's not in them. We look at the census records, he's not in them. Birth records, baptismal records, death records, nothing. He is not in them. So it's still a proven fact. Um, 
but there are a lot of things still yet to prove. That's why I'm a researcher, and it's so much fun. <laughs> but living on Drummond Island, it was great. Getting back in the fur trade, he was putting some money in his pocket because the War of 1812, when he was arrested, he lost everything. They confiscated all of his goods, they confiscated his guns because he was running guns. Went to Drummond Island. The United States government decided to do a survey and found out Drummond Island's within the United States territory. Okay, I want all you voyageurs out of French heritage and British <coughs> government. So again, he lost that home. So I find him coming down here, and it is the only record that proves that he was a bourgeois. He actually signed uh, a contract in Montreal working as a bourgeois, hiring uh, canoes and men for uh, a man in uh, Montreal, and came down into the United States because he'd lost everything. He needed money. So he worked for three years. Uh, this was in 1815 when this contract was made. He worked for him for three years, which was the normal amount of time that a contract would be made. So that meant that they were going into wintering quarters. So they would be leaving Montreal, they'd be coming down in here to the wilderness. And it would take three years for them to be able to establish where they were going to live, be able to collect the furs that they needed, and be able to trade the goods that they needed to, and then go back. So it was always for a three-year three, three year period. After that three years, we're finding it to be 1818. He decides, I can't do this anymore. At that time period, he is 40 years old. This is old at that time period, especially for anyone in the fur trade. Most men didn't live past 45. And if they were a boy's year, rarely past 39 to 40, because it was that rough for life. So we see him coming down to the United States. He had made some connections especially with Governor Cass in Michigan, and he became a United States citizen. But during that time period also, he found out a few other things, especially about this area here. He found out about one question that was asked here before was about a small fort. He had also was quite educated. He had read several maps. There was a small fort. It was not a fort. It was called Fort Petit. This was actually a fur trading post. And the main reason it was called a fort is because it was palisaded. And it wasn't a palisade because of Indian attacks. The palisade was logs all the way around it, pointed at the ends. This would go completely around that fur trading post. Within it, there are approximately three to four cabins and a couple of um, <coughs> canvas tents also put up in there for when they did trade. The uh, were not allowed to go into the villages according to the laws here in the United States, so the Indians had to come to them. If they got caught going into a village, every bit, of, every bit of their trade goods would be confiscated by the United States government. And they could actually be put into jail and never receive a license again. So Joseph Eddy received uh, his citizenship. But one very, very important thing at that time period, his wife. This is actually not a copy, but it's the actual abstract of the Joseph Bailey farm. Yeah, dude. <laughs> it's absolutely the original copy. In here, you'll also find treaties. A lot of treaty negotiations were going on after the War of 1812. The United States wanted to establish territory, open new territory, but first they had to get rid of something. Anybody know what that was? Native That's right. They had to get rid of the Native Americans. So the best way to do that was treaty negotiations. By the way, the United States made numerous treaty negotiations with Native Americans and have never kept one, not even one. And here it is showing that Bailey Homestead belonged to Moni. You know who Moni is, don't you? I remember the name. <laughs> Joseph Bailey's wife, Marie. Oh, that's Marie. Okay. Her land was given to her and her daughters. It's in a treaty right here. I also have the original patents. 
um, from LaPorte County as well as Porter County is showing that this land was given to the women. And it also shows through about three more treaties, more land that was given to them in different places. But they were women. Joseph Petty was in control. He made sure that these things were in his name. But one thing he could not do, even though his wife was Native American, he could never sell any of that land without taking her there and she would have to be presented to the judge and the judge would take her into a separate area and ask if she was coerced, threatened, uh, beaten, anything. And she had to sign the paper uh, before he could sell that land. And that's the way it was with any marriage at that time period or any woman. Uh, rarely were they able to own the title if they were married. Everything was under the man's name. So these records are proving that this land, when you look at the 35 west, 37 north, 10 south, yeah, this is the exact land they were given in the treaty negotiations. So we have a lot of land records to prove that. Uh, the Bailey Homestead today, as you can see, this is the house that exists there. It's not a piece of junk. It's beautiful. All of us want to move in tomorrow, right? <laughs> I'm sure every one of us have some sort of antique furniture that we can put in someplace. And there's three stories here. Beautiful fireplaces. This is on the second floor. This is what essentially his fur trading uh, cabin would have looked like, the way it would have been stocked when someone would come. Uh, this was built on much later. This was much later. This is the room that Marie Bailey, uh, his wife, lived in. The homestead is within the homestead. Joseph Bailey, his entire 800 some odd acres, he lived in a log cabin. A huge two story log cabin. It's within this house. You look at the pictures, you'll see huge logs like this into the sides of the wall. They still exist. They built this house within the house. And this was done not by essentially the Baileys, but by the daughters of the Baileys' husbands who went into the lumbering business after Joseph Bailey died. Uh, they went into the lumber business. They continued on. And the hardest way to describe Joseph Bailey is he was an honorable gentleman most of the time. He had we're going to say 10 children because they professed that Robert was his, their son as well. I just can't prove it. But that's my fault. <laughs> Still working on it, Jim. What about Cary Mission? Was he listed in Cary Mission? No. No. He is not listed there, but all three of the daughters, three of the daughters are, including Esther. Mm -hmm. And they were given land grants as well. So we'll let her look at some of that stuff, okay? But uh, he was a gentleman. He was a voyager to a certain degree. He was an unbelievable carpenter. Uh, we have his estate records. It's unbelievable the carpentry tool this, this man had. I'm a wood carver, so I know some of these tools. And oh, I'd love to have some of these planes and different things that he had. <clears throat> but he had an unbelievable amount of tools. He was trying to build a town. He became uh, a land speculator. So Joseph Bainick actually moved with the times. He knew at different time periods the different things that he actually needed to do. But was trying to buy land. Well, there's a new harbor going to be put in here, but he had to speculate where that harbor was going to be. He missed He thought it was going to be at Michigan City. It ended up being in Chicago. But he planned a town. Now this is something else about this town. When he actually plotted it out, he used the name of every one of his family, except one. No Robert. Every one of his daughters from that family, his wife, and then he started using the president's names. But Robert's not on there. And as much as supposedly he loved his son, uh, you would have thought it to be someplace. <coughs> 
So Joseph Bailey was a man of the future for the time period. He was all of these things. And he made sure that each and every one of his children for the time period and this time period had wonderful educations. Now, he died in 1835, leaving those daughters without a proper education. Now, this is what is very odd. From the letters that I found on the sons from the first marriage, they didn't like their father much, as I said. But they saw to it that those girls were educated. We have the records of the school records where the sons took turns paying for different terms for these girls to go to school. They would pay for their stamps so they could write letters home. They would pay for their paper, for their beds, for their music lessons, for their French lessons. And each one would pay for a different term, including Alexis, including uh, Francois. Uh, all of them took turns paying to make sure that these girls also were educated. As I said, he became a state representative of Minnesota. Uh, she became the first Native American Mother Superior in the state of Indiana. Uh, Hortensia, uh, Francis, and Alexis. This is Rose, the two of her children. This young lady here would have been the last Bailey representative of the homestead. And that would have been Francis. How? Her mother had moved to uh, Chicago, married uh, a merchant there in Cow, uh, but he died in a cholera uh, episode as well as his son. So she moved back to the homestead and took care of it for many years, and this is where you find all of the updates and everything in the homestead. One thing I found really intriguing about the homestead when you go to the third floor is there's a blow tube from the top to the bottom so that they could open it up just like on a ship. And the ship's captain would blow first into it, and then he would speak through this tube to give orders down below to the boilers where he wanted the engines to go faster. Well, down there was the kitchen they had built. They would give orders for their breakfast. So it's, it's amazing <laughs> to actually see the inside of this homestead. And it is so important that we continue this education for our children for them to be able to see this type of historical uh, building. But one of the most important things I think that Bailey gave us offhandedly we just don't uh, recognize is the fact of his journals. Hundreds of pages of journals. He told us every person, every person that came to the homestead. He wrote down the date. He wrote down the name. He wrote down what they traded for. So we know exactly what he traded with them. And it is probably one of the few records where we have the records here showing what he paid <coughs> actually uh, American Fur Trade Company for goods that he had shipped down here, then what he traded them for, the amount of money he traded them for to the people who came to the homestead, and also he did the Native American records also, writing the names of every one of these Native Americans down and what they traded. Say they wanted a two and a half point blanket, a uh, Hudson Bay blanket. That would be 30 rats. 30 rats is French for muskrats. If they paid for it, he wrote circles for each rat. When it was paid, he would make a line through each and every one of these circles. So they bought their blanket and they paid for it. If they hadn't paid for it yet, then it was owed and the circles would not be marked until they paid. So this is how he kept a record of it. It was rare to find uh, castor beavers or shebelles, the deer, um, very few. And mainly you have to realize this was nothing but a swamp area. Wherever you see the block, black soil, that was all swamp. It wasn't until the Dutch came in here in 1858, 1860s, and began to dig ditches, and that's when they began to build the railroads, that this swamp land uh, receded. So until that time period, you either live close to the lake, which Joseph Bailey did. He also took advantage of that. And then the fact when uh, more settlers started coming in, they needed transportation from South Bend, from Michigan City to Chicago. Well, there was too much swamp land in between. The stinky onion, which was swamp land and onions growing all around it, stuck like onions all the time, and it was underwater. Uh, Chicago today, as we see it, is actually built up on a platform of dirt. Uh, it wouldn't exist except that 
they made the town by filling it in with dirt. It would be probably at least 10 miles back further than what it is right now. That's all fill in that all those buildings are on right now. What Joseph Bailey did, like I said, he was always a man of the future. Hey, we need a stagecoach uh, place, right? Okay, so what he did is he had horses there. This is also proven from the state records. He had cows there, he had calves there, he had chickens there. He was self-sustaining completely and totally. The stagecoaches would come in, they would usually leave. Uh, unless there was a bad storm or the bridge was flooded out, they would hit the beach for the last 60 miles. So they had to trade horses there because the horses they brought in from Michigan City or South Bend, there was no way they were going to make them. That's a rough ride trying to get through that sand. Anybody ever run through the sand before? It's not very easy, is it? But when you've got horses hooked up to it, so they would trade horses there, since he would have stock for them. So most people don't realize just how many animals he actually had, or did he even have animals at the farm? But he did. So um, I'm going to allow you to look at my records. If you have any questions, please. Yes. This house, that mansion, that house is located right north of Steel Miller, right? Eh? On that yes. gate. Mm -hmm. And when I when they built that mill, Bethlehem Steel, they bulldozed a bunch of old houses out of there, and it had a sign that said Bailey Town. That's right. He, this was the town of the future for him. He had already um, so it's put names to every town, street, right? everything. They probably knocked a lot of historical stuff down when they built that mill. What? It's either been knocked out or swallowed by the dunes themselves. Now, do you know if you can still go in the house and see that stuff? Part of the National Lake Shore, right? As far as I know, for the last two years, I don't know if this is right or wrong, they are not opening the house. They are going to have it open this Saturday at the New England Heritage Day, so we open, I think, from 11 to 4. Okay. How do you get Thank you for the connection to it? Off, uh, take Highway 20 and then take Mineral Springs Road just north, about an eighth of a mile. Something yeah. Like yeah what, you got to walk to it? Yes, you, you have to walk to it. You have to park the lot. From Shelburne Farm, right? Right. right. Mm -hmm. But look, you probably know where that is, right? Yeah. Shelburg so, is like east, and the Bailey Homestead is more west. And one of the most important things, I believe, is about the location of uh, the Bailey Homestead. And of course, you can actually take the Little Calumet River all the way to the Mississippi River by using different portages. Uh, most people did not realize that, but Bailey being educated, uh, could read and write, and looked up all of the old maps that were written, even to the point of looking up Robert uh, Cavalier de la Salle uh, and the routes that he took, and followed that almost exactly. Yes? Since you're talking about language, could you tell me what language or languages would the Native Americans here have spoken I that he would have spoken? It would have been Algonquin? Okay. Same as his wives. That's why it was very important to have his uh, Native American wives, because they could uh, speak their languages and they could do the trade as well. Uh, as far as I know, Marie Bailey never learned to speak English uh, because in letters that we have found written by uh, Rose, um, she uh, at different times had to leave her children with her grandmother and she said those poor children and grandma could not speak to each other. Uh, but she always made sure that she had a, a, a gram of whiskey to keep warm and uh, a money belt inside of her skirt to keep her money as she traveled. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, didn't one of his boys, um, one of his daughters, were playing with his, uh, I heard a story about it, but it, uh, they were playing with a sword <coughs> outside the home. He accidentally got killed with a sword. No. That did not occur. Okay. That's in that book, Wolves Against the Moon. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the son, Robert, they thought that uh, is supposed to, um, was thought to have died in uh, an epidemic at uh, Mission uh, School, Terry Missions, up in uh, near Niles, Michigan. So he would have died there, not uh, in a sword fight in the backyard. Yeah, because it was him and his sister were playing with her. <coughs> right. And uh, like this lady said, the world's against the moon. That there is not effect. a lot of truth in the story. Um, it is basically to interest the reader and to make money. 
<laughs> well, don't leave it at that. Tell them that Mrs. Hall wrote the book. Though. I know. Yeah, so. I'm trying to behave myself. <laughs> she wrote the book, so it wasn't. Uh, essentially, she never got along with her neighbors. Uh, no one at the homestead did get along with them very well. Uh, and it's because uh, there was a language barrier. We, you had Swedish people moving in who spoke sw Swedish and, well, they spoke French. Uh, you had Americans moving in that spoke English. Uh, you had Germans moving in. What is los? Nichts haben eine Arbeit und sie tag nichts. Yeah, they didn't understand each other. There was a, a barrier there. So it took many years for the neighbors in any neighborhood to get along. That's why for years you found separate neighborhoods. That's the German one, that's the Polish one, that's the Italian one. That's where you go for your sausage, that's where you get your hair cut, that's, okay? And that's the way it's been until we've reached an education level uh, today to where our children are leaving our homes, leaving those neighborhoods, and these neighborhoods are disappearing because there's no longer a communications gap. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Now, he had a total of four different wives? No, or? two wives, that's all. Now, Those they, don't, they don't consider the Native Americans actually his wives, right? Yes, they do. They were both his wives. It's common law. I found no records to um, clarify the fact that these were uh, church marriages. The only fact that I do have is that Joseph Bailey became a citizen, in eight, a citizen in 1818, and I believe it was right then that he had a civil marriage with Marie. And this was done essentially because of the daughter who became a mother superior, became a nun, and it was essentially insisted that they get married before she could uh, join the church. So I think that it was not through the church that they got married, but it was a civil uh, marriage, and I believe Governor Cass actually performed it. Yes? Is there any, uh, did you find anything about him going down the Mississippi to Louisiana? No, there's no That's evidence another to that. Yes. Yes. There is a baby down uh, in Louisiana, but no relationship whatsoever, and actually they came from the Mackinac era, uh, area from a different family totally. They had no relationship whatsoever. But they were both Baileys, you mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. Spelled the same way? Or? Spelled the same way. So that might be why the confusion? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, many thought that he would uh, even went as far as Vincennes, and there's no uh, proof that he ever even went that far, or even to Lafayette. He mainly went north. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe as far as English Lake, uh, Kankakee River, uh, but mostly he stayed there at the homestead. You've got to realize when he did actually come down to the homestead in 1820, uh, he was already 40 years old, and when he died, uh, what, 54 years old. So that was quite old for a man uh, of his work. Yes? How, uh, what were the requirements for citizenship? How did he become a citizen? <laughs> How much was it? I really don't know because that was all kept under the books. But I imagine some favors were done uh, because uh, he had a tough time uh, getting the citizenship at first uh, because he didn't belong to a company. And most of them that belong to a company, uh, well, you can't get rid of all my voyageurs. It's going to take my trade goods. Uh, at that same time period, um, Fort William, which was on the very tip end of uh, Lake Superior, became one of the biggest forts in the entire United States because this is where the voyagers went to uh, when they went back into Canada. Uh, they could not go back to Mackinac Island. It was now part of the United States. They could not go to Drummond Island. It was part of the United States. So, so they went to the closest um, British territory they could, and that was up around the end of Lake Superior, which they just traveled through the, the, the Fox, the Illinois, and then up the Mississippi River right to that point. Yes? Was Marie his second wife? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. You know, on the Bailey Town map, they show the little calumet going through, or somewhere near. Yes. And they have a steamship. I've seen, you know, you see it. You see, I don't know how big the calumet was. Or how uh, that, 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 that's actually a, a fallacy. It would not have been deep enough even. I wouldn't think, but I... But I, I believe what it, you might take reference, reference to is Joseph Bailey, like I said, was an entrepreneur. He actually owned sh 
shares uh, in uh, a ship, steamship, uh, on Lake Michigan. And it was the first one to go down the Chicago River. Uh, it was called the Michigan. <laughs> and there's a big description about it here. Uh, he was uh, took shares in it with uh, the new birds. That's that little Cal River right by that house, down below yeah. that house, isn't it? Uh, that's, at, that's at that time, period, there would have been no way. Oh, small. When you, <laughs> even if it was even wider, you wouldn't have been able to. At that time period, trees were all over it. Uh, it had been cleaned, cleaned out by the Army Corps of Engineers, and there was none at that time period. So it would be impossible for more than a canoe to go down through and to clear its way. Yeah, but it is, in the, from it, it is in the map and does show it. And it's, right. it's, it makes you wonder. Yeah, but there's no that way. Maybe the river was wider at that time. But Even wider it couldn't because of the debris in the river. Mm -hmm. But it did not have the depth that you would need mm -hmm. uh, to hold the ballast of a steamship. What about the tavern? Is that Did that have any duration or was it ever, ever there? Yes, there was a tavern there, but it was not owned by Joseph Bailey. Joseph Bailey essentially ran uh, a, a guest house in the, the log cabins that were there. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I have letters uh, from the guests saying that they preferred to sleep outside the tree because the fleas were, so <laughs> <laughs> oh my. were biting them so bad and the blankets were full <laughs> of fleas. Uh, because essentially, they had to stack the, the people up and he had used those also to uh, hold his furs so the things were full of uh, bugs and fleas and stuff. But he did put on a nice meal. <laughs> and they also called him, uh, uh, how would you put this, nicely? <laughs> uh, a, a pudgy old Frenchman that was ill-educated. They had no idea of his education uh, and how many languages he could outspeak them in. He was very educated and very versed in many languages. Yes, sir. Bailey meeting Blackhawk, is that all? Okay. Say that again. Bailey meeting Blackhawk, Chief Blackhawk, when, um, uh, when the supposed raid was supposed to come down. No. Um, he may have met Blackhawk, who was Mite Shikaikaka. Uh, his name was actually Black Sparrowhawk. Um, he uh, did follow the salt trail, but he, and I would not doubt that they did not know each other, mainly because uh, Blackhawk, or Black Sparrowhawk, put it back to his name, was uh, a Brit. Uh, they would leave uh, their village uh, along the Mississippi River, or Black River, and then they would come right down where Bailey uh, Homestead is, and then they would go to uh, Sandwich, uh, which is right across from uh, Detroit, for annuity gifts from them so that they would stay uh, true to the British government. Um, essentially, they had been visited probably a hundred years earlier than any other uh, country and actually wore medals and different things that were given to them by the British government. So they fought on the British side uh, during the different wars. Uh, during the time period of the war, I doubt that he, well, I know for a fact he never saw Black Sparrow Hawk because Black Sparrow Hawk did not come this far, did not even come into Indiana, but curtailed and went up into Wisconsin. And then there tried to get across the river. Uh, losing over 500 of his people at that time period, uh, being shot uh, because the steamboat came up and began shooting at them. Okay. Any other questions? I think you said it before, but who's them two ladies on the right hand corner there? <coughs> These or here? Right there on the bottom, the bottom one. And this is Hortensia. And this is. Uh, Eleanor, uh, <coughs> Mary Cecilia. She dressed like a nun. Man. Yes, she was a mother superior. Yeah. Yeah. At St. Mary's College. Oh, I see what it was. Okay. And what does that have to do with it? Huh? What does it have to do with that? Baby? That was his daughter. Oh, really? Yes. Well, I not paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> you might give me a stick. <laughs> Please come up, uh, take a look, see if you have any more questions. Now, somebody said you could uh, go see that baby homestead this weekend? Yes. It's 
Better be in there. Messy house. It's probably just the bottom floor of the leak. I don't know. I don't know. She said you could get into the house. I don't know if they're going to open the house or not. It's been a while since I have, since I have been, been in the Chelberg homestead when they've opened it up, but I have not been in the basement. The biggest problem is the stairs, which are there. They don't let you upstairs. Because of the house. I have been upstairs. Yeah, they used to. Very good approach. Not anymore. That's why I brought pictures of some of the upstairs so you could actually see those and actually look out at the windows on the third floor. I mean, it's actually very beautiful tidy. You said it was built around his original log cabin? Yes. That was common back in the day. Yes, very much something. so, because it gave him a solid structure. Like yes, ma'am. Um, I have heard ghost stories about a young woman that walks around the area around Bailey Homestead and how Road. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, she bugs me anymore. I'm just going to walk on it. If she bugs me anymore, I'm just going to walk on it. I would not doubt, but I've had, I have heard the story, and I'm not going to doubt it at all. You don't Those have people. any idea if it would be a Bailey daughter or... <coughs> They haven't spoken to me personally, yeah. so I don't know what they are. This is how people were talking about about her book. <laughs> how about you, Jude? Do you have any encounters with the lady in white? No, but I just heard people, uh, people who actually lived there, you know, when they when they, they used to rent the place out, parts of the Billy Homestead, and they lived there, and they had trailers and, and different things, and they would talk about it. <clears throat> that they, they swear they saw somebody in the room. Well, I believe them. <laughs> and the Ghostbusters uh, uh, did go there, with their, well, not Ghostbusters, but you know that group in town. Ghost Chappers. Ghost Chappers. Ghost Chappers. Okay, yeah. all right. And they did go there and they used their equipment and so on, and, but I don't think they ever. It might be a good idea to take a psychic in and see if they can make a contact. <laughs> I'm, I'm not joking, really. It, it, it may be. Because uh, people have died in the house. One of his daughters actually died there. Um, they wondered for a long time what she actually died of. I found a newspaper account of her obituary saying that uh, she was uh, actually uh, having her uh, fifth child, which was a son. The son lived, but she did not. Do you know she how died. old she was? I'd have to actually look it up, but she was in her early 30s. Mm -hmm. Fifth child. And after that, he left the homestead. Mm -hmm. okay. Also, um, the Swedish farms. Mm -hmm. The Shelburne Farm, and then on the other side of Howell Road, that old Swedish farm. I, I, I work there. It's, I'm a teacher at the preschool there, the field station. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, were those all, was that all that property owned by Joseph Bailey before the Swedish people came? Yes. And they, they there bought was, uh, it. was approximately, what, 180, um, 850 acres? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So where was Bailey Town? Was it where the steel mill is now, Bailey Town, or did you said you had uh, Actually, no. The B Bailey Town was up on the road, on the uh, north side of the road, not on the south side of the road, because the south side of the road still flooded from uh, Lake Michigan. From north side of Twelve. <coughs> yeah. So from Twelve to the lake was all swamp, probably. Yeah. Yes. Probably still. The and it would actually, you know different times of the year it would, would flood back, especially in the spring. It was up on that hill then, like yeah, where so the headquarters back. were at. Yeah, it was back. Hey, you know there used to be a Nike base for the headquarters at? Yes. Because <coughs> I was stationed there. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs>